great to be with you. Let me add my welcome to that you've already received. It's an exciting time in life for our church, and it's great to have so many people connecting in here in the church and online as well. And we want to look today at the power of divine connections, the power of divine connections. We all want to live lives that make a difference, a difference to those around us, a difference to our cities, our world. But how do we do that? It's going to be impossible to flourish and become all that God has called us to be without meaningful connections, connections which give purpose and meaning and enable us to flourish and grow, our connection with God and our connections with others. And in a way, we've been living through an age of disconnection, dislocation. It's become very easy to be self-sufficient and isolated. And although we've never had more tools to connect with other people, sometimes we can find it hard to find and forge meaningful connections. And we see in this passage a pattern of life that might help us to make, to thrive in the midst of our greatest trials and even to make an impact with our lives. And the first thing we see is how important it is to stick close to Jesus. Jesus says, I am the true vine, you are the branches. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. You know, brother Andrew uh, died earlier this year and you'll be familiar with his life. A remarkable life of smuggling Bibles into countries where those Bibles were contraband, illegal. And he did that particularly in uh, communist nations in Eastern Europe during the Cold War. And he would pray this prayer as he came up to the border, his car filled with Bibles. He'd say, Jesus, you made blind eyes see. Now would you make seeing eyes blind? And again and again, the border guards would open up his boot and there'd be all these Bibles and for some reason they wouldn't see them. And he was able to disseminate thousands and thousands of Bibles throughout Uh, those regimes. And a friend of mine met him not that long ago. And he said, Brother Andrew, what's the key? What's the secret to living as you have lived a life that has borne much fruit for the kingdom of God through the decades? How do you do it? What's the most important thing? And he said just four words, stick close to Jesus. Stick close to Jesus. That's the key. All true fruitfulness flows from proximity to Jesus. We're transformed, made into something new through our connection, our proximity to Jesus. His life, his love, his power flows through us. Jesus is our source and our very life. And Jesus is describing here a life transformation that bears fruit, that might bear fruit in your life, in your family, in your community, in your relationships, the people you spend your time with without you even realizing it, without you forcing it, that because you're close to Jesus, you bear fruit when you're with others. So interesting, I, I used to do youth work in quite a rough area. And, um, and when we first started doing this youth work, I was, I was just 17 years old, and I'd have to go around and, and knock on the doors of this estate to get people's parents' permission before the youth could come to our youth group. And uh, I remember one day, um, I had the first two parents who knocked on the door. It was quite difficult interactions. And I said to my friend Susie, I said, I'm going to get knocked out by the end of this day. Like every person I spoke to was angry with me. They didn't want their kids to come to church. It's very difficult. And there was one person in particular, I knocked on the door. And his mum just smiled when I said, you know, we, your son wants to join our youth group. Just want to check that's okay. And she was very much of the opinion like, good luck, you know, it's going to be tricky. And he'd been expelled from a number of schools. No one had been able to change his behavior. Everyone had tried. He'd been in isolation and exclusion and everything you could possibly imagine. And even on the fringes of criminality and interacting with the police. And uh, he came to our youth group for a while. And uh, he was a handful. I'm going to be honest. It was tough. And after about three months, uh, I saw his mum, And she said, what are you doing? And I said, what? And she said, what are you doing? And I said, is everything okay? I mean, has he, has he done something? She said, he's different. And I said, in what way? She said, he's nice. He, <laughs> he's really nice. She said, he, he asked if he could help out in the house. 
He's never done that. He complimented his sister. He's never done that. He's changed. And I was thinking, what have we done? And I couldn't think of anything we'd done. Anything. Not one thing could I say to her, except for over those few months, he had been in the proximity of Jesus Christ. And nothing had been forced, nothing had been pushed, but he had changed. There are lots of books out there, lots of articles, lots of blogs, lots of apps, lots of ideas. Try harder, use this hack, this is how you change your life. But as Tim Keller says, Jesus isn't, is talking here about organic change through a new internal dynamic. He's not talking about mechanical change from the application of external force. You know, mechanical change from the application of external force, just trying harder, just doing better, just trying this hack, trying that hack, it's fine, it will take you so far. When people try and push things on you to change your behavior, sometimes it works for a little while. But long term, it doesn't make that much difference. If you've ever worked for any company or organization which has gone through a process of cultural change, you'll know it doesn't always work out. Have all the slogans, have all the initiatives, you have all the lead indicators, you have all the new behaviors that the resources team are trying to enculturate. I remember speaking to a friend during the last financial crisis. He said to me, Steve, I I don't know what they're thinking. I said, what do you mean? He said, they put these new slogans up in the lifts, like massive letters. I said, what do they say? He said, do the right thing. So you get a lift, you walk in, it just says, do the right thing. I said, is it working? He said, no, it's not working. I said, why? He said, because the entire organization culture rewards you for doing the wrong thing. So it's become a joke. The application of external force doesn't have an impact. People, any kind of change initiative, people don't change because you push things on them. People change because their hearts are one, because they internalize the reason why what you're trying to do. Otherwise, it's just temporary behavioral adaptation. I still remember when I was uh, 18 years old, a girl, a friend of mine, a Christian girl in my class took me to one side after class. She said, Stephen, can I give you some feedback? If someone says that, you always say no. And, uh, and I said, yeah, of course. And she said, you keep your faith in a box. And I said, I thought, well, you know, I mean, I had a pri- private personal faith, but I thought that was a bit harsh. And um, she said, you keep your faith in a box. And I said, yeah, it's safe there. You know? And um, she said, well, you're never going to help anyone with your life if you keep your faith in a box. And then she just turned around and walked off. Becky. And so all the way home, <laughs> all the way home on the bus, I was like, Becky, who's she? Doing? Becky, she doesn't know me. She doesn't judge me. Becky, who she thinks she is? Becky. I got home to my mum. I was saying, this girl called Becky was saying this thing about me and faith in a box. My mum, very serious, was like, well, she doesn't know you that well. I was like, no, she doesn't know me that well. Becky. Anyway, for about three days, it irritated me for three days. And, but I started to feel guilty. So I thought, right, I will. I'll take my faith out of the box and I'll show her. And... Um, <laughs> And so really grudgingly, really unhappily, I, I, you know, I, I started kind of dropping into conversations, went to church every now and again. No one seemed that interested in the way I did it. And um, you know, I'd say, you know, oh yeah, I guess, well, Christians deserve a chance. You know, stuff like that made absolutely no difference. And after about two weeks, I just reverted back to putting it quite nice and safe in my box. Thank you very much. Because actually, we don't change by pressure from outside. We change from transformation from within. But then when I got a bit closer to Jesus without me even realizing it. Like the love I had for him and the love I realized he had for me changed my heart. And it just started cropping up. It caught me out. I'd be in a pub with a mate and I'd just start talking about church. I was like, oh, I didn't even, I had to catch myself and stop myself doing it. So I was changed from within. It's like when uh, a friend, not a friend actually, someone I knew at church, um, took me to one side. He said, Steve, I do hope you're tithing. I said, what? And he said, well, you know, it's a good principle to give the first 10% of your income to the church. I thought, who do you think you are? It's like, my money, back off. So angry for three days. (laughs) Who does he think he is? I really don't like being told what to do. I was like, like, this guy is outrageous. You know, and he was British. British people know that you're never supposed to speak about money. <laughs> made absolutely no difference to me. The only difference it made 
was I put a bit more of the shrapnel from my nights out in clubs into the offertory. Do you remember those offertory baskets when they came around? I'd kind of dig, dig, dig a bit deeper. I'd put some coins in. I'd chuck it in. But I was grudging. I wasn't happy about it. And then as I got a bit closer to Jesus, something changed in my heart. And no one had to tell me, but suddenly I was like, I, I, I really want to give to Jesus. I even got, can you believe this? I got a scholarship for law school, like 12 and a half thousand pounds. And for some reason I thought, I want to give a significant portion of that scholarship to the church. That's crazy talk. Like no one would ever tell you to do that. In fact, someone had told me, don't do that. That's extreme. I didn't even tell my parents because I'd worried they'd stop me. I was used to hiding my behavior from my parents. I'd go out to clubs, sneak back into the house. Now I was hiding giving to the church from my parents. That's inward change. But no one had pushed me to do it. I'd got close to Jesus and it made all the difference. If you want to experience fruitfulness in your life, make it your aim, your ambition to be close to Jesus. And then without you even realizing it, you won't be able to stop bearing fruit. It just kind of rubs off on you. His love, his gentleness, his kindness, his compassion, his generosity. How do we do that? Two top tips today. Uh, first is um, Jesus is so important if we want Jesus to remain in us and us to remain in Jesus, to read his words. Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you. I mean, who is Jesus? Jesus isn't a blank canvas on which we paint our own personal preferences. He's a person. And he speaks and he has purposes and commands. And it's not that easy to distinguish Jesus from his words. It's not like as um, I got some feedback this week, someone said uh, to um, a colleague, they said, oh, I like, I like, they watch on the live streams, if you're watching, hi there. Um, he, he said, I like Steve, but I think he, his clothes are too dark. And, um, you know, it's helpful feedback. I'm very grateful for that feedback. He said, I'm thinking about buying him some brighter clothes. I don't mind. That's a very kind of him. And, um, uh, but you can distinguish me from the clothes that I wear. That's fine. You know, but if he said, I like Steve, but I don't like his mind, his heart, his body, uh, his personality, and his face. I don't like any of those things. You'd think, well, I'm not sure you do like him. <laughs> you know, we, we can't distinguish Jesus from his words. Jesus is the incarnate word. He is the word made flesh. Jesus' words are the overflow, the outflow of what is most central and core to his character, his identity. And so I want to encourage you, if you've never done it before, Spend some time reading his words. Get Jesus' words dwelling on the inside of you. Maybe just read a chapter a day of one of the Gospels over the next you know, month. Just read a chapter a day. And just look at him. Spend time thinking about Jesus. So that's the first thing. Get his words on the inside of you. And then secondly, Ask him to stay with you. Take some time this week. I just encourage you, pray this prayer. Jesus, I want to remain in you. Would you remain in me? Maybe you want to put on your phone, you just want to put on a lock screen, um, on your save screen on your phone, the word remain. And every time you look at it, you think, remain. I want to remain in Jesus. I want Jesus to remain in me. Maybe put a poster on your laptop, Remain. Have to be a little bit careful if you're in the office because people will be like, guys, the Brexit referendum was a long time ago. Um, you know, six years ago, let it go. It's like, you know. But just put remain or stay. The word remain means stay more. So, Jesus, I want to stay more in your presence. I want you to stay more with me. And every time you see it, just pray that prayer. Jesus, would you remain in me? And would you help me to remain in you? All true fruitfulness comes from proximity to Jesus. We want to stick close to Jesus. But then we want to be shaped by Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it'll be even more fruitful. And Jesus uses this metaphor of pruning. And I find this hugely challenging 
and also greatly encouraging. It puts both branches are cut. The branch that bears no fruit, the one that is only outwardly connected to the vine but actually has no true life flowing through it, that branch is cut off. But then even the branch that bears fruit and seems to be doing well is cut back. One is cut off and one is cut back. And I find this kind of challenging but also encouraging because it's like your reward for following Jesus faithfully and bearing fruit for him is pruning. And pruning is not a nice to experience. I've managed to just give you a little demonstration here. Um, I mean, you know, if you're pruning and you're a gardener, um, you, you have to cut back right to the knuckle even of the plant that seems to be bearing a lot of fruit. So um, it doesn't look good. If you watch a gardener pruning, it looks like they're causing absolute havoc to the plant. It looks like they're attacking the plant. You know, they're cutting, oh, that's been a fruitful uh, branch. It's borne fruit this year. Let's get rid of it. Um, let's cut it right back to another. Oh, yeah, that's, that seems to be doing well. Let's cut it right back. Uh, oh, there's another one. Oh, that seems to be doing quite well. Let's cut it right back. And there's another one. That seems to be doing quite well. Cut it right back. And you're left with this ugly thing. And it looks to the external eye like the gardener is punishing the plant. It's like punishing the branches that bore fruit. But the gardener isn't punishing it. The gardener is preparing it. Preparing it for even greater fruitfulness. It looks cruel. It looks unkind. But absolutely, it's absolutely essential for the plant to flourish. It's essential for even greater fruitfulness. It's so important to us. There are times in life when you're being cut back. There are times in life where God is using whatever suffering you're facing to refine your character. And if you misunderstand it, you look at what's happening in your life and you think, I must have upset God. I must have done the wrong thing. God must have abandoned me. I must be outside his purpose for my life. It must all be going wrong. Whereas actually, you might be experiencing the kindness of God in your pruning. And he's not punishing you. He's preparing you for even greater fruitfulness in the future. Don't misunderstand. You know, the blades are sharp. But the hands that wield them are kind and they're committed to your good. They're committed to your fruitfulness and they're not going to let anything get in the way. There's been times in my life God has pruned bad habits that needed to be cut out. There's been times in my life God has pruned good things which I would never have wanted to let go of. Sometimes it's relationships. Sometimes it's things in our careers. Sometimes it's, it's disappointments, things we'd long to come to pass which didn't come to pass. And we can look at it and think, why? But if the gardener is skilled, nothing that is needful is cut away. And actually the process of it being cut away is essential to the long-term fruitfulness of the plant. I dare you to pray, whatever you're going through today, to pray, Jesus, would you prune me? Jesus, would you use whatever I'm going through, whatever I'm facing in my life right now, to cut me back so I might bear greater fruit for you? I wonder what that is in your life at the moment. What do you need cutting back? Can I be really honest with you? Is that okay? Um, lean in, confession time. Um, if I need one thing pruning in my life at the moment, it's my iPhone. You know, I, I love my iPhone. It, um, it enables me, I can, I can listen to Simon's podcast on it, um, unscripted, available at all good podcast places. You know, I can read my Bible on it, I can do my emails, I can do my WhatsApp, I can stay in contact with people. But I just spend too much time, I'm tethered to it. Sometimes I think, I think I'm using it, but then sometimes I think it's using me. Sometimes I think it's a product that I've bought, sometimes I think I'm a product that it's bought. It's an amazing thing. We had an amazing uh, breakfast yesterday with uh, someone who used to work for Apple. I love my iPhone. But I think I need its activity in my life to be pruned. Now, how can I do that? Well, you know, <laughs> there's an easy way and a hard way. 
You know, the, the hard way would be just to kind of, I mean, it doesn't prune that easily. Um, but if I was to start, oh, oops. Um, <laughs> it's going to hurt. But at the moment, I'm focusing on deleting the apps that are distracting me. I'm using grayscale so the screen isn't too attractive. I'm using time limiters, but I want to get it back in check. Because I think, actually, my approach to this phone at the moment is one of the biggest obstacles to me sensing Jesus remaining in me and me remaining in him. For you, it might be something entirely different. Are you willing to pray, Jesus, would you prune me so that I might be fruitful? But how can you trust him? You might be going something, through something at the moment, and you might say, but I, this is just really painful. This is really challenging. I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. It's really tough. How can you trust him to use even those most difficult things, even those things that are not necessarily of God, but for him to use them to prune you? Well, today of all days, we remember the sacrifice you know, that greater love has no one than this, than that they laid down their life for their friends. That extraordinary sacrifice through the generations, in the generations, of whole generations, for freedom and redemption. I was having some physio on Friday because I, I pulled a muscle and I was trying to explain to my physio why it's a significant verse. Greater love has no one than this, than that they lay down their life for their friends. And he said, can you say that again? And I said it again. And then he said, can you say that again? And then there was just a silence as he just stood there and thought about the significance of that verse. And then he just took a step back and said, that's powerful. And it is powerful. Jesus laid down his life for you before you were even his friend. Jesus was cut off so that you might only be cut back. You can trust him. Even when it's tough, even when the pruning hurts, you can trust him. So we want to stick close to Jesus. We want to be shaped by Jesus. And then we want to be connected to each other. Now, vines are inherently connected. The grapes are all connected through the vine to the other grapes. The branches are all connected through the vine to the other branches. If one part suffers, it affects the whole. If one part is pruned, it enables the whole to flourish. And if a part of the vine, a part of the branch becomes separate from the vine, it cannot flourish. It will gradually wither. This is a crazy time. I think it's a time to lean into connection. I've noticed in my life at points, there are times when it's very easy to become self-contained, self-sufficient, self-isolated in a way. Like, we're okay, we can get by, let's just look after us. Very tempting to do that at times in life, when it's a bit full on, when you're a bit stretched, when there's a lot going on. And it's tricky getting connected into the vine, because I don't know if you've realized this, but sometimes people can be a little bit complicated. Um, I've never met any complicated people here, but, I, but it, they say in some places there are complicated people. They say unhelpful things. They can sometimes be a bit insensitive. Sometimes people let you down, and it can feel easier to go it alone. But we're meant to be connected the branch becomes separate from the vine. It can't be fruitful. I am the true vine, you are the branches. Just want to say, Jesus didn't say, he never said, I am the jar, you are the marbles. It would be much easier if he said that. Because then we could all be you know, self-contained, self-sufficient marbles. We'd come together for 90 minutes, roll around a bit, unconnected, and then go off into our separate lives. Self-contained, not connected. Inhabit the same space for a bit of time, but essentially be on our own. That's not what Jesus said. He didn't say that. Jesus said, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Interconnected, interwoven, mutually dependent. Each one connected to each other through the vine. Do you know what I love about this church? I love that I see this in this church. 
People from every different ethnicity, nationality, background, socioeconomic space. People with very, very different lives. People who are flourishing in their jobs and are very successful. People who are struggling and holding on by their fingertips. People who are walking through great joy and people who are experiencing great grief. Sometimes at the same time. And yet we come together and we are connected together. And in spite of the distinctions between us, the differences between us, we are united, one Lord, one faith, one baptism through the vine, through Jesus Christ himself. We're not marbles, we're grapes. We're connected through the vine. And that means as you go out into your workplace, your community, your school, your hospital, your business, wherever it is you are, your family, you're still connected. You can still be fruitful through Jesus, we're connected. And the fruitfulness comes from that connection. Is it tricky at times? Yes. That's why Jesus commands love one another. You're like, why did you command it, Jesus? Because it's hard. Because it would be so much easier not to. Because things get in the way of that. It's not possible to... Be connected in this way without risk. But life's about risk. If you insulate your life from all risk, you'll also insulate your life from all joy. And I dare you today, between now and Christmas, why don't you take a step into community? Why don't you lean into community? Maybe you want to join one of our teams. Maybe you want to join one of our groups all over the city. But take a step into community. Do something to lean in to the vine. Reach out to someone you know who's struggling. Pick up the phone to someone who you know is going through a difficult, hard time. Send a text to someone who you think might need an encouragement. We're meant to do this together. And just think what could happen as we want to stick close to Jesus, as we open up our lives to be pruned by him, even though it hurts at times, and as we stay connected to each other, think how he might use us in all the places he's placed us to bear fruit. People might look at us and say, there's something different about that community. There's something different about the way they love each other. There's something different about their unity in spite of the differences between them, in spite of the different backgrounds they come from. Look what is happening in their midst. Tozer said this, has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same tuning fork are automatically tuned to each other? They're of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard which to each one must individually bow. So a few hundred worshippers together focusing on Jesus will be more one in heart than at any other time. Let's focus on him. Let's stick close to him. Let's ask him to remain in us and see what he might do. In Jesus' name, amen.